We look back at 12 months of getting you answers. It's been a busy year for our Target 8 investigators, from exposing scams to flaws in the system. First tonight, a man is released after spending 21 years in prison for a murder he did not commit. Target 8 investigator Ken Kolker first told you about the flaws in Jeff Titus's conviction in a 2017 Target 8 story. And Ken was there when Titus was finally released back in February. I want to see my grandkids. I haven't seen them. I want to go see them. Jeff Titus wasn't sure this would ever happen. He was 50 when convicted in 2002 and sentenced to life in prison without parole. He's 71 now. Can you talk about what last night was like? I mean, I can't even imagine. I bawled a lot. I just literally shook. I was crying so much. He was convicted of killing hunters Doug Estes and Jim Bennett in the Fulton State game area. The system that put me here, oh. A Target 8 investigation in 2017 exposed major flaws in the case. Among them, alibi witnesses who placed Titus 27 miles away at the time of the killings were ignored by the cold case team that pursued him. But I really thank you for that article back in 17. It meant a lot, and that was the start of it. The original detectives in the case had cleared Titus in the deaths. They later asked the Michigan Innocence Clinic to investigate. Today, the sons of one of those detectives were outside the prison to greet Titus. Their father, Royce Ballot, died last year. Pleased to meet you. Oh, my mom's so proud. I knew her out right now. I told her. She's crying. I knew she, I was going to get out. And she told me we knew you we were going to get out for 21 years. Yeah. You should have never been there. Also at the prison, the producers of the podcast and investigative discovery show who uncovered the existence of an alternate suspect, Thomas Dillon, who had confessed to killing five hunters and outdoorsmen in Ohio. Susan! Welcome out. They also discovered Ohio police reports about Dillon's possible link to the Kalamazoo case, reports that never reached prosecutors, Titus's defense, or the jury. It just changed everything for my whole case. And you turned around seeing that picture of Thomas Dillon. And, then, and the police had that file, and they didn't do nothing with it. They hit it, and they did that. Yes, they did. Titus is the 40th prisoner the Michigan Innocence Clinic has helped set free in 14 years. It's unfortunate that, uh, that the system failed just so badly. But, you know, today we're just happy going forward, and we're looking forward to the next chapter in Just Life. Today, it meant the three-cheese skillet with pancakes at Coldwater Garden Restaurant. And soon... Sweetwater Donut Mill. I want a New York cheesecake. I mean, I'm going to go in, I'm probably going to buy a half a dozen or maybe even three dozen. On a cold, rainy night in October, an 83-year-old man walked out of a Jenison adult foster care home. Seven hours later, he was found dead in a grassy area outside the home. No one inside the home had noticed him missing. Ken Coker has the timeline of the death, which prompted state investigators to recommend shutting down that home. A state report on the death shows the woman who was legally blind was somehow able to get outside the home at Eastern Avenue and 60th Street undetected after bedtime on June 2nd, 2022, without her walker. She was such a sweet lady. The report said alarms on exit doors were, quote, either inoperable or disengaged. The lead medical technician who found the woman and who was identified in that state report says staff had warned American House Management that the door alarms were not working. But they were just neglecting it and weren't paying attention. She asked not to be identified, saying she feared retribution from the Toledo-based company. She says she quit last year. I feel like, yes, they should have alarms on in all buildings. It wasn't clear which door the woman used to walk away. Workers told the state the doors lock from the outside, but do not keep residents from leaving. It wasn't until the day after the death, according to a state report, that workers installed an alarm on the front door. And the following day I came back and they were installing them alarms. Also the next day, according to a lawsuit filed with the family, a relative overheard a worker saying he had fixed the alarm on the side door nearest the pond. The home also emptied the pond the next day. Relatives told the state that Jean Bruin had a bad day, hallucinating about her deceased mother and husband. And she was just like hallucinating. 
She was acting like if she was going to go out to a party with her deceased husband. Staff at the home told the state that the woman was in bed peacefully sleeping with her cat, Samantha, when they checked her room at 8 that night. The lead med tech, who was working alone by then, says Bruin was gone when she checked the room on her rounds two hours later. Kind of panicking a little bit. She checked everywhere, inside, then out. The last place I, I checked was the pond. Like something just told me, you know, um, just go check the pond, you know, and yeah, sure enough, she was just laying, you know, there. Face down in a small pond just feet from the side door. The State Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs issued a violation for failing to provide adequate supervision and protection. American House Senior Living operates 18 adult foster homes in West Michigan, in Kentwood, Jenison, Holland, and Spring Lake. Since last year, the state has cited six of the 18 homes for not having enough staffing to adequately care for residents. The state also is investigating the October 13th death of 83-year-old Calvin Powers, whose body was found outside after he had walked away from American House Adult Foster Care Home in Jenison. That home has doors that lock from the inside. Coming up, an adoption scam that broke one couple's heart, their story, and why an adoption expert called the incident so unusual. Scammers can take your money, but they can also break your heart. Target 8 Susan Samples has the story of a Utah woman who scammed a Rockford couple thinking they were adopting three little girls and the West Michigan Adoption Agency being investigated for letting it happen. Nico and Sarah Galle of Rockford already have a little girl, but felt called to adopt and were thrilled in July when their adoption agency, Greater Hopes of Wyoming, connected them with a supposed teen mom in Utah who wanted to adopt out her two-year-old twins and an 18-month-old. In six weeks, the Galleys raised more than $32,000 through GoFundMe and turned it over to Greater Hopes. But in late September, days before the girls were set to arrive in Michigan, a devastating update. The Galleys wrote that a teenage girl claiming to be a birth mom deceived them and their adoption agency about her entire backstory, her identity, and more gut-wrenching about the young girls being her children. The galleys, declining to talk on camera at this point, told us the woman turned out to be related to the girls, but not their mom. We FaceTimed with these girls, wrote the galleys on Facebook. It's an eerie, icky feeling knowing that these girls were rightfully somebody else's and not up for adoption. And she was most likely babysitting at the time that the videos and FaceTime took place. It's not... Um, unheard of, but it's not common. Deb Gustin, a well-known New Jersey-based adoption attorney, says scams like this one are unusual. She hears of one every couple of years, and in most cases says when there's an attorney involved, the scammer is quickly exposed. One of the things that we always try to get very early on, for example, is proof of pregnancy, but we don't want to get it from the person who says they're pregnant because, you know, with Photoshop and everything else that we can use, people can manipulate documents all the time. We don't know when Greater Hopes demanded documented proof from the supposed bio mom. The agency said it could not comment due to confidentiality and the sensitive nature of their work. The scam was exposed, according to the Galleys, when the woman and children could not make the trip to Michigan from Utah because the so-called birth mom could not produce her ID. The Galleys noted online that all the money that has been donated has already been paid to the agency and will be used for our future adoption. We want to be clear, they wrote, the young woman posing as birth mother did not receive or request any funds during this process. If you've been doing this as long as I have, every once in a while you see someone who is what we would call an emotional scammer. They're looking for attention more than money. Still to come, Target 8 investigates a Grand Rapids contractor after he fails to deliver to customers. How missing countertops could lead to future charges. From con men to bad contractors, Target 8 was on the case. Henry Erb was there when unhappy customers and police paid a visit to a contractor who claimed he was just too busy to get the job done. 
just want my stuff. And this Ionia County couple had help from two Kenwood police officers to get it. On a cool December morning, they all trooped into the elite home and stone supply just off Broadmoor. They were after some granite countertops Nicole and Bill Thompson had already paid for. He said it would be a week and then he would have it installed. A week later, no call, no show. Their countertops remained plywood for weeks. It's just been one excuse after another. They say the company made appointments, they take off work to meet the crew, but nobody'd show up. The frustration is about more than the time and the money Nicole inherited from her father and was using for the kitchen remodel. I lost my dad and it was just something, part of my inheritance that I wanted something nice from, something that I could look at, maybe, you know, do the family memories that we did growing up and cooking and stuff together and having a good family gathering in the kitchen. And that's how we all ended up a couple of days later with a Kentwood police officer politely asking business owner Eric King if the Thompsons could get their granite so another installer could finish the kitchen. Yeah, have them pull in the back and okay. it's all right there. All right, and that's what they did. The Thompsons got their granite. We are so far behind. We have funds on clients. It happens every year. Everybody's trying to get everything done. I'm happy. I got my happy ending. But that's not even half the story. As the Thompson's countertops were being loaded, Eric King was out front being frisked and handcuffed. He was under arrest. Nothing to do with the granite business, but with a lawsuit against his now defunct company called King Builders. A judge had issued a warrant because King missed a court date and wanted police to bring him in to reveal his assets. We want justice, number one. The arrest is connected to Andrew Asasi's lawsuit. He says his family hired King to build a small cottage on some land up north and gave him $60,000 to get started. He had said that he would have the property built in a little over three months. In the trench? But Asasi says months went by, some dirt got moved around, fun for kids to play in, but not much happened. After more than a year, Asasi says he'd heard enough excuses, went to court and got a judgment. But the family is still trying to get the money back. Looks like we're not going to see any of it, unless, of course, the money is somewhere else in assets that we aren't aware of. The Asasi family's not alone. King Builders has three other judgments against it in Kent's County Circuit Court. King owes Trinity Baptist Church in Grand Rapids $156,000 for work the church says it paid for, but King failed to do. And a couple of suppliers got judgments totaling more than $100,000. And as we've seen, Eric King's newest venture is distressing some customers, too. They include the deputy mayor of Ionia. He finally got new countertops, but he ended up getting them from somebody else. And that's why I think we trusted him too much too soon. John Maluski says King comes across as a charming guy when he's selling a job, but he says King missed installation dates and broke promises. The final straw was just after King missed another install date when he was arrested. He describes how in a phone conversation he tried to pin King down to the next promised delivery. So what I'm hearing from you is that you will reach out to our contractor by, say, 8 p.m. tonight and arrange a installation date later this week. Yes, we'll do that. That was the last communication I had with him. Our contractor did not hear from him. He says his kitchen remodel contractor ate the loss of a $5,800 payment when they had to buy the countertops from a different supplier and is trying to get the money back from King. This shouldn't have to happen to anybody else going forward. We had questions for Eric King, but he didn't respond to our emails. A state police detective was planning on talking to him this week. A prosecuting attorney will eventually decide whether or not he broke any laws. I'm Target 8 investigator Henry Herb. Coming up is a consumer's worst nightmare, zombie debt. How old bills you thought were gone can come back and haunt you. And finally tonight, you think zombies aren't for real? Think again. Susan Samples found these zombies aren't out for your flesh, they're out for your wallet. Somehow overnight we got old. We weren't expecting it, but it happened. <laughs> this is not the retirement Deb and Eli Yoder had envisioned. He has always been so strong and a very, very hard worker. At 72, Eli's heart is failing, and he's dependent on his wife of 50 years, who also cares for her 90-year-old mom. 
The Yoders rely on Social Security, had to take a second mortgage on their Hastings home to pay Eli's medical bills. I pay my bills. You know, I've never claimed bankruptcy or anything like that. And then I just get this in the mail and I started crying. It was an out of the blue bill, nearly three grand, for what Deb said she had no idea. So she demanded more detail. And it was from a medical procedure that I had done back in March 29th of 2018. That's right, it was a bill from Deb's leg surgery five years ago. And not for the operation itself, but for a compression device the hospital sent home with her. Who pays attention to where their medical supplies come from when you're in the hospital? Deb said she called her insurance company, which explained it had denied payment to the Oklahoma Medical Device Company because it was out of network. Oh, and that denial had to be disputed within one year. Well, obviously I couldn't dispute it because I didn't know about it. I'm dumbfounded. Why would they wait so long? We found the answer buried in the papers Deb received. It turns out the Oklahoma Device Company just sold its old uncollected accounts, 27,000 of them, including Deb's, to a debt purchasing company. It's big business, the buying and selling of debt. The lender has given up on collecting. They've written it off, but then they sell it in bulk to big companies for just pennies on the dollar. They're coming for you. Look, there comes one of them now. The buyers then resurrect the so-called zombie debt, hunt you down, and in many cases, take you to court. If you fail to respond, the debt buyer can get a default judgment against you and garnish your assets. It's a system Target 8 investigators have exposed before, and one that has since been declared outdated and inconsistent by a commission launched by Michigan's Supreme Court. In the last year, the Justice for All Commission reported debt collection cases are flooding Michigan civil court dockets, and more than half of them are filed by five large national companies that buy up credit card, medical, and utility debts at greatly discounted rates. Research showed most of the cases, 68%, end in an automatic win for the debt collector. And three out of four cases that reach judgment end with a court authorizing the seizure of the defendant's assets, wages, and tax returns. The commission recommended ways to make the process more equitable equitable, consistent, and easier for citizens to navigate. But a lot of people just don't know how to respond, don't think they can respond, they can't afford a lawyer. Consumer attorney Mike Nelson said you should not ignore a debt or a lawsuit, even if you can't pay. For one thing, it's possible the bill isn't even yours. Quite often, I see people who get sued for something that is not their debt at all. Nelson said the court does little to independently confirm the debt claim is valid. And even if it is, in some cases, you don't have to pay it. Under Michigan law, if a debt is more than six years old, you're off the hook. Nelson said the statute of limitations drops to just four years if the debt is from the sale of a good, not a service. Which brings us back to Deb Yoder's bill. This looks to me like a sale of goods. This company in Oklahoma didn't perform any service. They allegedly sold her a good, a, a medical device. So I think it's a pretty good argument that this is all barred by the statute of limitations, which is four years. Deb's debt, if you don't recall, was incurred five years ago and came at a particularly difficult time. I was so upset. I mean, I couldn't think straight. Thanks for joining us. Tomorrow, West Michigan on the move. We'll look at the projects reshaping your town and your neighborhood. Good night.